RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave. We're going back to 1983 today and if I say the name Mattel to you, what would be the first thing that you think of? Well, let me jog your memory with this distributors catalogue from the same year. And in here we find such delights as Twirly Curls Barbie, well I guess some things never change, the slightly nightmarish Monchichis, of course the ever-present Hot Wheels cars, and they look good, and the master of the universe himself, it's He-Man. I had a castle grace gone myself and took great pleasure in sending Skeletor through the trapdoor. Now the closest things we find to a computer in this catalogue are these. The teach and learn computer all over the page, there's the children's discovery system, the likes of which we saw many toy companies produced and they were little more than glorified calculators or speak and spells with a small LCD display and a selection of games to help with maths or vocab. You know the type of thing I mean. The catalogue though doesn't tell us the full story because Mattel had previous in their Intellivision console, something we'll talk about a little later today, and in that very same year, 1983, they bought out this, the Mattel Aquarius. Like so many others, Mattel wanted to get on board with what looked like was going to be a runaway train, a runaway success of home micros all around the world. And they weren't the first toy company to think of doing this. You'll remember if you saw my Dragon 32 series that Met Toy had the same idea and they bankrolled Dragon Data to create the Dragon 32. So were these micro machines to be the future for Mattel? Could they emulate the success of the Ataris, of the Commodores of the world, over here in the UK, of Sinclair with their Spectrum range? Well, I can tell you now the answer is definitely no, because this is one of the most unsuccessful launches of a microcomputer of all time. It absolutely flopped. And today we'll find out why and we'll also find out if my pickup here, which I collected recently, works, if we need to do some repair work on it and learn all about the history of the Mattel Aquarius. So let's see what we've got on the desk here and find out a little bit more. So everything you see on the table here I picked up from a classified ad recently for just £60 and it was advertised as boxed and as working. Well, just one of those two statements turned out to be true and you can see the boxes on the table so you can figure out which one it is. But I was still pretty happy with what I've got because not only have we got the computer, we've got the printer over here, we've got the data recorder to play tapes, we've got the memory expansion and we'll talk about why we need that. We've got a game, a cartridge-based game in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, as well as some tape games. Let's start with the computer. We'll open it up and have a look at it here. Now, with an original price point of $160, this was a little bit more expensive than its main competitor, and the price was dropped accordingly when it came to the UK. Its main competitor here being the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, or I guess the Auric one, which also turned out to be something of a, a low seller, but they didn't know that was going to be the case at the time. Obviously the last thing played was that Dungeons & Dragons game because the cartridge is still in there, we'll take that out. Now you can immediately see that this is built to a low price point. There is a keyboard overlay which I've put on there, that's interchangeable, that's the default keyboard overlay. And you can see it has basic commands on there because on the ROM in there is Microsoft Basic. But there's a rubber chiclet keyboard and I never thought I'd hear myself say this, this keyboard is worse, in my opinion, than the ZX Spectrum's dead flesh keyboard. Here's the ZX Spectrum. I think it's just the fact that the keys are a little bit wider that makes this better on the Spectrum. The action is just as high, the rubber is just as rubbery, but because these are thinner keys, I don't know, I think your fingers just sort of slide off the side and you're never quite sure if you've pressed them. So, for the first time in my life, I found a keyboard that's not, that's worse than the ZX Spectrum. Wasn't expecting to find that. 
So it's quite toy-like in its design. Where I've taken the cartridge out, there should be a filler that goes in there. Hopefully we'll find that in one of the boxes. Size-wise, it's about as big as an Acorn Electron. And on the back we have cassette port, we have the printer port, and an RF out. We'll need to tune a TV in to use this, so don't expect the greatest picture quality from it when we test it out. And there's, nothing, there's just the power switch on the side, so there's very little to it. And if I pop the lid off, we'll see what's driving it inside. There is the keyboard ribbon cable to connect it to the main board, so just be careful. Oh, just be careful, he says, as the keyboard overlay flies off. Um, just be careful if you're opening it up not to catch that ribbon cable and break it. So what is driving this? Well, the CPU is a Z80, just like the ZX Spectrum and many other computers of the period, running at 3.5 MHz. More often than not, these would be NEC branded Z80s, as this was manufactured in Asia by Radofin. You can see the label there. But we've actually got a Zilog Z80 here. So this was uh, manufactured slightly differently to others. And Radofin would also manufacture the Dragon MSX for Eurohard, who were part of the Dragon 32 story we mentioned earlier. But that never left the prototype stage. So there's some fun crossover there between our two stories. When it comes to memory, this thing only has four kilobytes of memory, a ridiculously low amount of memory, even by 1983 standards. In 1980, the VIC-20 had 5K. In 1982, if you had a little bit more money, the Commodore 64, of course, had 64K. The ZX Spectrum had a 16 or 48K option, so 4K it just wasn't cutting it. And add to that fact, when you've loaded the operating system, when you've loaded BASIC into the machine, when you get to a point where you can actually start typing on it and using it, the message comes up, free memory available, just 1.7 kilobytes. Ridiculous. Who thought that was a good idea? And that, of course, is where this comes in, the 16K memory pack, which would give us an additional 16K, of course, taking that up to 20K. Oh, we've got all sorts in here. We've got the, that looks like the cable for the cassette player. So that's in the wrong box. Here's our 16K. So this slots in here, and you'll immediately be saying to yourself, well, hang on a minute. How do I use the 16K of memory? and a cartridge-based game at the same time? And the answer is you can't. It's one or the other. One in, one out. Unless you bought yourself this. This is the Mini Expander. It's a whopping big expansion, as tall as the system itself, which gave you two cartridge slots, so you could put both your memory and your game in there. And it also offered two additional sound channels. Now this thing only has one sound channel by default, so that takes you up to three sound channels. And you can say goodbye to what few design lines the computer had when this was installed. It may as well have been branded the Transformer computer and had an Autobot hologram stuck onto the front of it. In its defense, I guess, when that memory module's in there or when a cartridge is in there, there's no risk of RAM pack wobble, something that plagued the ZX Spectrum. If it wobbled in the slightest bit, it would reset the computer. That's in there nice and firm and solid. So let's take some silver linings from this. Now there's also a ROM chip on here, which contains the operating system and Microsoft Basic, of course. There are two types of ROM chip in the Aquarius the new and the old, and we can't identify which we've got by looking at the chip itself. But when we turn it on, we'll be able to see from the message on the screen itself, if indeed we get a message. And the difference between the two is that on the old ROM, the one that was originally shipped with it, there were bugs, primarily bugs with the C load basic command, which was used for tape loading. So that was quickly fixed and a new ROM was issued. So while the Aquarius did come in at a low price point to compete with the Spectrums, with the Oryx, with the TI-99s and all of the other low cost computers, by the time you'd added the cost of the RAM pack, uh, maybe the mini expander and any other accessories you needed that came as standard with those other machines, you were getting up to Commodore 64, to other microcomputer price points that, well, they would have served you a lot better. We'll continue our tour of the system and the other accessories that I've got shortly, but first let's learn a little bit more about just exactly how this machine came into existence. While Mattel had never sold a microcomputer like the Aquarius before, it had come close with the Intellivision in 1979. This was a pure games console in direct competition with the Atari 2600, and it wasn't a bad effort, all things considered. 
It offered superior graphics and sound to the market leader as it should be released three years after Atari, and it was supported by a very well-funded marketing campaign. Mattel Electronics shifted over a million Intellivisions in 1981 alone. It was a pretty good effort, but from the moment the Intellivision was marketed, there was a promise that Mattel repeatedly failed to deliver, the soon-to-be-arriving keyboard component. This would convert the Intellivision into a fully-fledged home computer. It would do it quite deceptively, not just by adding a keyboard, but also by adding a 6502 CPU, as found in the Commodore PET and Apple II, which would be hidden away inside the keyboard case. The Intellivision then would become a dual CPU home computer executing both 6502 code and its native CP1610 CPU code. A fine, if slightly quirky idea, if it wasn't for delays of over two years from those initial promises. The keyboard did finally make it to market, but not until 1981, where it was sold only in Seattle and New Orleans and at a price of $600. $600, that's utterly ridiculous. Some say it was only actually released to satisfy the FTC, who had levied massive fines at the company for advertising a product that looked like it was never going to be released. Very few are thought to have even made it further than programmers and developers at Mattel, so I guess that makes it pretty collectible today. The solder fumes had not affected everyone's brain at Mattel, however, because in parallel to this project, another development had taken place, the ECS, or Entertainment Computer System. This was another keyboard add-on for the Intellivision aimed at schools, and it lacked the 6502 CPU, making it a far cheaper and less complex device to create. It also came with 2 kilobytes of RAM and BASIC on ROM. This seemed to be a much better idea, but it didn't make it to market until 1983, when it was launched in January at CES in Las Vegas. By now though, the Intellivision as a platform for computing was dated and the new Commodore 64s and so many more advanced computers were much more attractive propositions. Mattel would continue to operate in the games console market with the Intellivision 2 console, but if it wanted to get a foot in the home micro market, it did need something fresh, and it needed it right now. Don't be a nerk! Buy in television! To solve this problem, they would turn to Radofin in Hong Kong, the company who were manufacturing in televisions for them, and as fortune had it, Radofin had some new computer designs in the pipeline, designs which used off-the-shelf parts and could very quickly be manufactured. One of those designs was codenamed Checkers, and that would become the Aquarius. The other, the more complex Chess, was slated to become the Aquarius too. And of course, it's that first machine that we're exploring today. We saw the basic specs of the machine earlier then. There's the Z80A CPU, 4K of RAM, 8K of ROM with Microsoft Basic in there, and a further 2K with the character set stored in there. What you won't find is any kind of programmable video circuitry. There's nothing special in there whatsoever in terms of hardware sprite acceleration or anything to help it along its way. It's a very basic machine. In terms of audio, there's just one single tone generator. And if you wanted any more than that, you needed the mini expander, which we saw earlier. And that contained the same AY audio chip as the much earlier in television. This then, a very basic machine that's not going to trouble the Commodore 64 with its VIC-2 video chip, with its SID sound chip. That was in a different league altogether. That being said, it could have been a lot worse. Mattel did tweak the original Radofin design to add a larger character set in ROM, and that included things like a running man character, so that games could make better use of those predefined characters in their games, should they want to. I hate then to say that this was destined for failure from the start, but in the words of the very developers and programmers that created it, it was a microcomputer for the 1970s and not for 1983. Let's take a look at my specific Aquarius then, get to know it a little better and see if we've got any problems that need fixing up. Here is our Aquarius then, and my example isn't in terrible condition for its age. Granted, it's a little yellow and discoloured around the edges, and maybe we can fix that up. And also, some of those rubber keys are quite worn down. That's not something that would be so easy to fix. I think they would actually need replacement keys if we can manage to find some.
We have looked inside and it's pretty clean. The original electrolytic capacitors are still in place and there are no heat sinks on the chips, just a voltage regulator attached to the metal chassis itself to use as a crude heat sink. But otherwise, it's not in bad shape at all. We have the original power brick and that should kick out 8.8, 16 and negative 19 volts DC and we can quickly check that's the case before putting power through the board. So we'll unclip the power cable here and just test the levels with the multimeter. They'll be a little higher than it says on the case because the power supply isn't under any kind of load. So I'm looking for them to be within a few volts with a solid reading that isn't drifting up or down and it does all look good when we test it out here. So let's plug it in and we'll see what happens. Because the video out is an RF output, we'll need to tune in the TV and this raises a common problem that I have with flat screen TVs. We are getting something from the Aquarius but it won't tune into it properly because these newer TVs are just too precise. There isn't enough tolerance I find of those old analog RF signals in the TV's digital circuitry and more often than not I just can't get old micros to tune into it. The VCR tends to be far better at this sort of thing and sure enough we have a nice solid picture from the Aquarius and Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which is actually a pretty fun game to play as it turns out. Do we have a fully working machine then? Well all is not as it seems, that would be too easy. But I can fully understand why this was sold as working. The seller probably didn't test it for long enough to see the problems, because after about 25 minutes of use the screen started to flicker like this, and the more I used it the more it flickered until we lost the screen entirely. If I let it cool down, everything is fine again for around another 25 minutes. So all in all, not a bad pickup for the price and something I think we can easily fix up. So that's what we'll do right now. This kind of intermittent problem caused when the system warms up is very, very frequently caused by capacitors. I know we swap them a lot on this channel, but they are such a common point of failure. And when we look around the board, I can see one capacitor with early signs of problems. It's this 16 volt 10,000 microfarad cap. If we look at the negative end, it looked a little discolored. And sure enough, if we check the ESR or equivalent series resistance on the capacitor, we have a reading of over 0.3 ohms. And for this capacitor, as we can see on the crib sheet stuck to the front of my tester, 0.08 should be the upper limit in the absolute worst case scenario. So 0.3 is way over that, which means we have a problem. So I swapped it out and, well, as I had them in stock and there aren't many caps on this board, I swapped them all out anyway. And I can tell you now that all of the other capacitors tested out just fine, they were well within their tolerances. And it wasn't a necessary step, it's just me being pedantic and putting new capacitors in as a preventative maintenance measure. So while I'm soldering them in, I often get asked the question in comments, why do I snip the legs and then solder? And I'll tell you why. It's because when I didn't, I would often get asked, why don't I snip the legs and then solder? And honestly, it's not something I gave a great deal of thought to until those discussions in the comment section. But when I checked it out, sure enough, the correct textbook procedure is to snip first and then solder. This is because snipping after you solder can shock the joint. Is it likely to cause me lots of problems if I don't do that? Well, no, not really. We're talking about textbook procedure to meet military precision standards and avoid failure in mission or life critical situations. But if people take inspiration to try things out from watching my videos, I do try to set a good example. So now you know why. And of course, I get less comments complaining about it, so that's good. Okay, job done. And thankfully, because we caught that failure early, there doesn't seem to have been any damage caused elsewhere on the board. 
and on testing again for a good hour this time, I experienced no further problems with the screen. Our dungeon crawler was interrupted only by giant spiders and bats and no technical issues this time. So we have a much happier Aquarius now, a fairly simple fix for a simple computer by a simple man. I hope you'll join me in part two when we look at what happened next with the Aquarius. Did the Aquarius 2 ever make it to market? And did it leave any kind of legacy whatsoever for other manufacturers to learn from? We already know it wasn't a success, but just how bad was that failure? Did anything good whatsoever come out of it? Find out in part two. We'll also need to give it a good clean up maybe do some retro brighting and try out all of those peripherals that we have and maybe some of those cassette tapes as well. Until next time, take care and thank you for watching. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.